Hey y'all, Miss Mayhew here, and we are going to do some notes over proteins. We're gonna start off by reviewing some of the stuff from your macromolecule vocab study set. In each row, you're going to highlight or circle the box that goes along with the proteins. So the first row, you're gonna circle or highlight the elements that are associated with proteins. The box that you should have highlighted or circled is the box with the C-H-O-N. Proteins are made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now in your second row, you're gonna highlight the box that is an example of different types of proteins. The box that you should have highlighted is the box with hemoglobin, which is a protein in your blood cells, catalase, which is an enzyme, um, albumin, which is another protein found in your blood, and keratin, a protein used for structure. The next row, you are gonna highlight or circle the type of bond that you can find in proteins. In this row, you should have circled peptide bonds. Proteins are often referred to as polypeptides. That is because they're made up of multiple peptide bonds between amino acids. The fourth row, you're gonna highlight the function of proteins. In this row, you should have highlighted transport, structure, enzymes, storage, and movement. There are lots of different proteins involved in a bunch of different functions in our bodies and the, the cells of other organisms as well. Now, your last row, you are going to highlight or circle the monomer that makes up proteins. The box that you should have highlighted in this row is amino acids. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Now I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about the structure of proteins. Starting with the structure of a monomer of a protein, which is an amino acid. Now, proteins are made up of a bunch of amino acids linked together, and there are several different amino acids to choose from. Now, these amino acids are made up of five main things. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that structure starting with the central carbon. At the focal point of each amino acid, there is a single carbon that the rest of these groups that I'm gonna to talk to you about are connected to. Connected to that central carbon, we also have a hydrogen. Traditionally, we put our central carbon in the middle, obviously, and the hydrogen on the top. Now, connected to the central carbon, we also have groups called amino groups, and carboxyl groups. An amino group is consistent of an N for nitrogen and two hydrogens. The carboxyl group is a carbon, two oxygens, and a hydrogen. It looks like this. We have a carbon, an oxygen double bonded to that carbon, and then an OH group bonded to the carbon as well. Sometimes you may just see it written as COOH. These amino groups and carboxyl groups are important because they allow these amino acids to act as both an acid and a base. The last part of an amino acid is something that we refer to as an R group. The R group is going to be what's different in each amino acid. And the R group is super important because depending on what this R group is, that will give the amino acid different properties, whether it be hydrophobic based on the R group or hydrophilic based on the R group. Those are important things that the R group is going to give to each amino acid. And these R groups can interact with each other. For example, here I have two cysteine amino acids that are interacting with each other. My cysteine molecule has an R group with a CH2 and an SH. This R group is bonded to the central carbon that all amino acids have, which also has a, a carboxyl group 
which is inferred to be right here, an amino group, which is right here, and that hydrogen. Now, as you can see, these two cysteine molecules are interacting with each other, and they're able to form a covalent bond. In this case, a disulfide bridge or a disulfide bond. Each amino acid is linked to another through these peptide bonds, and these peptide bonds are formed through a condensation reaction, meaning water forming. We also refer to this as dehydration synthesis. So we're taking water out of these molecules in order to form a bond. This only can take place when you have an amino group coming into contact with a carboxyl group. So, for example, if I have two amino acids, they're gonna look something like this. One amino acid consists of a central carbon, an amino group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen, and an R group. My second one is made up of the same thing. A central carbon, an amino group, a carboxyl group, a hydrogen, and an R group. When they're lined up next to each other, just like I've drawn them, this is where we can actually have this reaction taking place. Once these amino acids are properly aligned, now dehydration synthesis can occur. In order to form the peptide bond between these two, we have to remove a water and form a water molecule. We're gonna do that by taking one hydrogen off of a amino group and an OH group from the carboxyl group. And we're gonna remove these, forming a bond between the carbon in the carboxyl group and the nitrogen in the amino group of a different amino acid. Here again, we have two separate amino acids and we have a carboxyl group and amino group next to each other. We are going to remove one hydrogen from the amino group and an OH group from the carboxyl. And that's going to leave us with a peptide bond between these two amino acids, right between the carbon of the carboxyl group and the nitrogen of the amino group. Now y'all also need to understand that there are different levels of protein folding. Proteins are able to function because they're shaped a certain way. The reason they're shaped a certain way is because they have different levels of folding. The first structure or the first level of protein structure we refer to as the primary structure. Now the primary structure of a protein is simply the sequence of amino acids. So the order of amino acids with different R groups is going to make a difference down the line. But primarily, this is our first level of structure. Our secondary structure is going to be the regular repeated spatial patterns in different regions resulting from hydrogen bonding. And there are two different um, structures. The first one we refer to as an alpha helix, and the second we refer to as a beta pleated sheet. The tertiary structure is the, the 3D structure of the polypeptide chain where it bends and folds and actually starts to give this 3D shape to the protein. The way that these proteins are able to fold up in this shape is because of the interactions within the R groups or between different R groups um, that form things like the disulfide bridge or hydrogen bonds. There are also hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions and ionic interactions between the different R groups of the protein. Quaternary structure is when you have two or more proteins that are interacting and binding together through these interactions and bonds that allow the protein to be functional. For example, we have an alpha subunit and a beta subunit that make up your um, hemoglobin, the protein in your blood cells. If you'd like to see some visuals of these different levels of protein folding, there's a great video that is in the Unit 1 playlist and I'll go ahead and make a link to that 
in the description box. So let's talk about some examples of the structure affecting the function in proteins. I'm gonna start off with the example of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein that transports oxygen um, throughout your cardiovascular system. Hemoglobin is made up of four subunits, like you saw briefly in the last picture. These four subunits interact with each other um, and they're shaped a certain way so that they can interact with the oxygen and carry it, kind of like a bowl. Another example we can use is an enzyme called lactase. Lactase is an enzyme that breaks down lactose, a disaccharide, into its individual monosaccharides. In order for this to happen, the lactose has to be able to bind to the lactase enzyme. And in order for it to bind to the enzyme, the enzyme has to be shaped specifically in a way that the active site interacts with the lactose molecule. Now, it's important for me to emphasize the fact that each level of protein folding and protein structure is the foundation for the next layer of protein folding. So the secondary tertiary protein structures are derivative of the primary structure because that order of amino acid sequences determines the interactions between our groups. Now, proteins can be denatured. Denaturing is a process where either heat or chemicals are used to disrupt the interactions within a protein. This is going to destroy the secondary and tertiary structure. So it kind of breaks the bonds and changes the shape of the protein entirely. Now, the primary structure is still gonna same, stay the same, it doesn't reorder the amino acid, it just changes the bonds that interact with each other to give it its shape. Now, when the protein is cooled, then it can return to normal because all of the information that is needed to specify that unique shape is contained in the primary structure, the order and sequence of the amino acids. The factors that can disrupt the interactions determining the protein structures and denature a protein are things like temperature, being too hot, for example, concentration of hydrogen, high concentration of polar substances, or non-polar substances. That's it for this set of notes. Be sure to ask your teacher if you have any questions.